Okay, so I am acutely aware that I am the last thing between you and the cocktail hour, and so I'm going to try very hard to keep to time um, and not drown you in too much detail. So uh, here's the basic problem that I want to talk about this afternoon, and that is this problem of Alzheimer's disease that's been introduced. And uh, what makes it particularly hard for us as a society is that it's uh, a very common disease. 10% of people over the age of 65, so I'm getting into the danger zone here, and about half of people over the age of 85. And we're really at the point uh, at which this disorder is becoming epidemic. It's costly to society in excess of $200 billion a year and climbing, and of course, what makes it particularly difficult is that it, it, it's effectively untreatable and it's progressive. So once it's diagnosed, it, it uh, uh, proceeds pretty much inexorably to uh, full-on dementia, although that doesn't necessarily lead to physical death, uh, somewhat unfortunately. There are a few treatments known, such as memantine that Stu Lipton uh, mentioned and uh, Aricept that give you uh, mild transient cognitive benefit. And while it's thought of as a disease of neuronal death, it, it really, like uh, virtually every other neurodegenerative disorder, really starts as a disease of synapse loss. So that axons detach from their targets, uh, leading to a variety of cellular defects, uh, ultimately culminating in neuronal death. And as you know, there are two major pathologies, the so-called amyloid plaques and the neurofibrillary tangles, and the sort of long-standing dogma for this disorder, which I'm going to disagree with, is the so-called amyloid cascade hypothesis, which posits that the plaques or something in the plaques or the precursors to the plaques or something involving the plaques uh, is necessary and sufficient to lead to all downstream abnormalities, including uh, these neurofibrillary tangles composed of a protein called tau in a hyperphosphorylated form. Now, the plaques are composed largely of this short peptide I've drawn in pink here, which is derived by proteolysis from a larger amyloid precursor protein, or APP, and there are two proteolytic clips one just uh, past the transmembrane region in this type 1 transmembrane protein called beta secretase, one proteolytic clip called gamma secretase, uh, which is within the transmembrane region. It's a very unusual biochemical uh, reaction. And then it has a short cytosolic tail, this large extracellular domain. And uh, as some of you know, uh, gamma cleavage does not happen until beta cleavage has happened. So they're dependent proteolytic events. Now, you might ask, what do we know about the validity of the amyloid cascade hypothesis? And I'll just mention, I checked this morning, there are in excess of 100,000 papers in the literature about Alzheimer's disease. I sometimes joke that for every result, there's an equal and opposite uh, co-result or antagonistic result. So you can find almost anything you want in the literature, but the fundamental problem has been that while there are a variety of treatments that have been tested in humans that seem to eliminate the amyloid plaques, these have not resulted in arrest of the disorder. And we know that uh, probably a number of people in this room have amyloid plaques throughout their brains, but they don't obviously have Alzheimer's disease and may not yet develop it. So there's something that's not quite right about this hypothesis in my view. Now, the simplest version of this hypothesis, what you might think of as a one-hit hypothesis, is that either mutations in the gene encoding APP in humans or mutations in the gamma secretase uh, proteolytic subunit called presenilin or so-called sporadic genomes. And I'll just uh, mention at this point that these mutations that cause early onset strictly hereditary Alzheimer's disease are actually quite rare. They're uh, probably less than 3 to 5% of the population of Alzheimer's patients, 
And the majority of disease is dominated by so-called sporadic genomes, that is some combination of genetic factors that may lead to elevated risk. We know that the heritability of the disorder is on the order of half to two-thirds, so it has a strong genetic component, the major one of which is your allele at the ApoE locus, which is a cholesterol carrier uh, that is uh, involved in the formation of HDL in the brain, and in fact is the major cholesterol source in the human brain. Uh, and if you have ApoE4 alleles, they can elevate your risk from on the order of two to four fold if you have one uh, ApoE4 allele to up to tenfold if you have two ApoE4 alleles, almost to the point where it acts as a, a low penetrance genetic mutation. There are also environmental risk factors. For example, as you heard from Rodrigo Chavez earlier in the day, traumatic brain injury, or TBI, is one of the few uh, highly reproducible risk factors in the disorder. And I'll tell you about one more in a few minutes that we think we validated. Now, one of the puzzles of this disorder has been that while the amyloid cascade hypothesis imagines that all forms of Alzheimer's disease result from elevation of one of these A-beta species called A-beta-42, and this A-beta species is posited to lead to neurofibrillary tangles, ultimately leading to synapse loss and death, the fact is that most of these genetic components or risk factors or mutations actually generate, whoops, other phenotypes that are uh, neuron specific, such as changes in axonal transport that I'll show you in a moment, changes in endocytic trafficking also that I'll show you momentarily. But what's a little perplexing in this view is that these other phenotypes, which are clearly functionally important, are not thought to be part of the pathway leading to Alzheimer's disease. And so they're thought to be off pathway in this view of the world. I frankly don't buy that. And there's a lot more thought of so-called multiple hit models where the notion is that this collection of risk factors and mutations lead to elevation of a beta perhaps, as well as these other neuronal phenotypes. I'll just mention at this point that endocytic defects seen in Alzheimer's disease have actually been found to arise quite early in life. Actually, in utero, uh, in work done by Ann Cataldo, these endocytic defects arise as early as seven months of gestational age, leading to the view, uh, along with other uh, observations, that this may be a lifelong disease in some way. And the notion in these multiple hit models is that some sort of collaboration between A beta and these other phenotypes or these other phenotypes on their own lead to changes in phosph phosphorylation of tau and neurofibrillary tangles ultimately leading to synapse loss and death. And to be honest, it's not been possible to really clearly distinguish amongst these various views thus far. And that's an important part of the reason, uh, no doubt, that we have effectively no useful therapeutic agents at this point, and uh, the pessimists among us don't even imagine that the pipeline has very much in it, and we'll see how that works out. Whoops. Okay, so I clearly hit the wrong button here. No, maybe it's that one. No, that one, there we go. Now, the neuron is one of the most unusual cells in uh, most organisms. Uh, these cells are very highly polarized with a cell body region that uh, provides a lot of the synthesis uh, in these cells. There are large axons that lead to the presynaptic ending. These axons have microtubules within them that serve as railroad tracks along which molecular motors move a whole variety of components needed for the health of the presynaptic ending as well as the signal sending machinery. The dendrite, on the other hand, has a whole different set of components that are required for signal reception, and the neuron is quite good at sending the right materials into the axon and to the presynaptic ending, 
versus transport into the dendrites by a, a molecular process that's somewhat different than uh, so-called axonal transport that runs from cell body to presynaptic ending. Now, this diagram dramatically underestimates the size problem that these cells have. Since most textbook diagrams draw these little short axons running from cell body to presynaptic ending, but if you look at motor neurons that uh, have their cell bodies in the spinal cord and run their axons down to our toes, these axons can be a meter or more in length, depending on how tall you are. And even in the, the CNS, some of these axons can be, for example, in the basal forebrain cholinergic neurons, several centimeters or more in length. So this transport of materials to the presynaptic ending is a really important part of the biology of these cells. Now, over the years, we and others have shown that you can follow axonal transport, in this case, in a fruit fly model by tagging, uh, in this case, amyloid precursor protein with GFP. And you can see this movement in real time. It runs on the order of a micron per second. And for those meter long axons, it takes on the order of 10 days for materials to get from the cell bodies down to the toes. Now, in a number of uh, genetic mutations and disease states, you see things more like this, where there are obviously blobs or clogs in the axons that interfere with proper transport, as well as a reduction in the rates of movement of many of the axonal cargos. And in the case of Alzheimer's disease mutations, uh, Liz Rodriguez some years ago in my lab and Garaz Stoken showed that these pathologies of large axonal dystrophies uh, happen early in the disease, well before the formation of amyloid plaques or neurofibrillary tangles, and the mutations that cause disease in some cases lead to actual changes in the velocity of moving amyloid precursor protein containing vesicles. And so we've thought for a number of years that axonal transport changes, although originally thought to be late features of disease, are in fact very early phenotypes in disease. Now, that leads to the question of what causes these changes in movement of axonal vesicles and organelles, and clearly then something upstream of this process must be misbehaving in disease. And this is where the endocytic process and a related process called transcytosis, where materials cross compartment borders in the neuron from the cell body region into the axon, leading to the formation of vesicles with molecular motors. And I'll just uh, indicate to you here in green the tau protein, which aggregates to form neurofibrillary tangles, but in its day job, its normal function is in fact, we think, to regulate both the formation of the microtubules and to regulate the movement of the molecular motors along the microtubule track within the axon and work from the Mandelkovs and uh, a number of other groups over the years has shown that phosphorylation of tau at a variety of sites in this protein lead to dissociation of the tau protein from the microtubule, thereby letting the molecular motors move in a uh, uh, both longer and faster than would normally be observed. And so the question then is what sorts of processes are upstream of the phosphorylation of tau and what types of processes are upstream of the formation of these motor vesicle complexes? And I'll give you or I'll tell you about two vignettes that we think are ultimately important to understanding disease mutations. Now, while this work was originally done in our lab in fruit fly and mouse models, some years ago we elected to switch to human models. And there are a number of reasons for making that switch. One, as you heard earlier, humans are not just big mice. Uh, second, it turns out that in order to get 
mice to demonstrate the pathology of Alzheimer's disease, you must express human versions of the amyloid precursor protein, presenilin, and tau protein. So mouse proteins on their own, or even when mutated, simply will not form human-like pathologies of disease. And even when you make the mice express human pathologies, they don't actually get true Alzheimer's disease. So there's something different about the mouse and the human. You know, there's a variety of obvious ones, but of course, there's thousands of mouse genes at work in these cells that are different in sequence than their human counterparts. And that's probably really important to uh, disease in our view. And so we switched to the human IPS models uh, some years ago, and in essence, what we did was to take uh, patient fibroblasts that came from humans that had hereditary Alzheimer's disease, in this particular case, extra copies of the APP gene in these humans who developed early onset Alzheimer's disease, and as has been described multiple times today, Mason Israel and a number of other folks in the lab made IPS cells from them, we also made iPS cells from fibroblast biopsies of so-called SAD or sporadic Alzheimer patients. Again, we don't know what the genetic mutations are that are causative in these patients. And then so-called NDC or non-demented control patients who then served as controls. And you can see that if you make neurons and measure secretion of the A beta peptide, which forms these amyloid plaques, uh, you can see that the non-demented controls have what we would say are relatively low levels of A-beta secretion. The two APP duplication patients we checked both have elevated levels of A-beta secretion, and one of the sporadics looked more like controls. One of the other sporadics that we sampled in this early experiment looked more like the hereditary mutations. We did multiple lines from all of these patients and averaged the data, so we're reasonably sure that they're characteristic of the genetic mutations. And then when we went on to look at, for example, phosphorylation of tau at a site associated with disease pathology, the two hereditary disease patients showed elevated levels of phosphorylated tau at 3 and 231. The controls, again, looked somewhat lower, and the sporadics seemed to split, one looking more like a control, one looking more like a hereditary mutation. Now, we, in this case, Grace Woodruff and Saul Reyna, then realized that one of the problems with this system, as I've just, just defined it, is that nobody shares the genomic background with anybody else. And in fact, humans are genetically incredibly diverse. And so you really want to be able to look at mutation effects in isogenic backgrounds. And so we made IPS lines from Craig Venter, who's our neighbor here uh, in San Diego. Craig wants to become the you know, typical human subject for all diseases. And in fact, his genome has been sequenced. He's an APOE4 heterozygote. I'm not divulging anything confidential, by the way. He's published all of this. And he has variants in a variety of other genes, some of which predispose and some of which are protective for all sorts of different diseases. So far, he seems to be cognitively normal, at least in the opinion of some of us. Um, and so we've used Craig as a genetic background into which we've uh, used Talon or CRISPR mutagenesis to insert mutations in this case, a delta E9 mutation in the presenilin 1 gene. And then Grace and Saul looked at what early changes do you find in neurons that carry, in this case, a presenilin 1 mutation. And what was really quite obvious early on was that if you look at wild type neuronal cell bodies, they exhibit some level of staining for the amyloid precursor protein, which is ultimately exported into axons. And then as you look at heterozygotes and then homozygotes for these delta E9 mutations that were made in this now isogenic background, you'll see that there's more and more accumulation of amyloid precursor protein in the cell bodies of these neurons. 
And if you look at the axons of these same mutations, what you see is that the controls are much higher in levels of axonal APP than the heterozygotes and then the homozygotes. And so there's clearly some defect in the export of amyloid precursor protein in these mutations into the axon. Now, to get at the question of what in particular is changed in these cells leading to this reduction in APP in the axons, they made use of a microfluidic system originally described by Newley June and then modified by Emily Niederst in my group. And the basic idea is that using lithography, you can make these little PDMS chambers where there are two wells that have media and then running between those two wells are narrow five micron channels. And you can plate neuronal progenitors in one side, and then as they differentiate into neurons, they extend their axons through these narrow little grooves, allowing you to get spatial segregation of the axons from the cell body and the dendrites. So you can treat drugs on the cell body side only, for example, and what's shown here are staining for the axons that you can see in this chamber over here. The cell body regions stained for either MAP2 or for the nuclei of the cells are restricted to this side. And if you uh, look a little more carefully, I can't quite see it from here, but you probably can, that there are these red axons running through these chambers. And so it's possible to quantify very precisely how materials are moving from the cell bodies through axons and out to the synapse using a variety of different probes. So for example, you can take an antibody that recognizes the extracellular or N-terminal part of APP shown in yellow here. You add the antibody, it'll bind to the extracellular region of APP. It can then be endocytosed into vesicles and then you can quantify how much of the APP reaches the axon and how long it takes it to get there, for example. Alternatively, you can take lipoproteins, which neurons endocytose uh, readily, add them just to the cell body side, and measure the rate at which they find their way into the axonal compartment. For the sake of honesty, I'll just tell you that we use labeled low-density lipoprotein, which these cells uh, express the receptors for, uh, because getting your hands on APOE-containing HDL is quite a project. Chaoshan Yang has a poster downstairs that you can look at where he describes a system for making neuronal HDL ordinarily produced by astrocytes and microglia. And in fact, I'll just mention that while I won't show you the data, labeled LDL is even more dramatically reduced in its transcytosis in these mutations than is APP, which I'll show you uh, here, for example, where you can see that just by just staining and by eye alone, you can see that in wild-type cells, transcytosis results in you know, some level of staining of uh, uh, APP in these axons that has been labeled prior to endocytosis and then movement across the compartment boundary between the cell body and the axon. And you can see that's progressively reduced in these mutations. So endocytosis and also transcytosis of APP and lipoproteins are defective very early in these presenilin mutant neurons in a human uh, isogenic uh, uh, collection. We've also, we, I love this we, Grace uh, and Saul made uh, APP mutations and looked at APP transcytosis. This is also true then of APP mutations as well as presenilin mutations. And so they all seem to share this defect in the ability to transcytose materials from the cell body into the axon. And this appears to be a fairly early uh, phenotype, well before and in fact, in the absence of any amyloid plaques or neurofibrillary tangles having formed in these cells. And so clearly, defects in transcytosis are upstream in some way of the formation and movement of these APP-containing vesicles. We think the hang-up of APP is in 
uh, a stage of endocytosis uh, characterized by the recycling endosome, which sends APP and other materials either into the axon to the cell surface or back into the Golgi uh, for uh, destruction. Now, you can then say, well, clearly these transcytotic endocytic defects are early and may be upstream of these changes in tau and synapse loss. In fact, it would make sense that if you can't properly transport materials to the presynaptic ending, you can't maintain a proper synapse. And so it's sensible that this is some part of the disease process. And Carolyn Sferazza in the lab is now trying to sort out what exactly is wrong with the recycling endosome and how is that related to disease phenotypes. Now, the other issue is, you know, what is upstream biochemically of uh, abnormal phosphorylation of tau protein. And I told you that APP duplications in these neurons made from IPS cells exhibit elevated levels of phosphorylation of tau uh, at uh, a pathological site in the protein. And so Cheryl Herrera and Dan Williams in my group teamed up with Ann Bang at Sanford Burnham Prebus to do a drug screen. And my expectation going into this was, well, we'd find a bunch of kinase inhibitors and they would allow us to figure out what the kinase pathway looked like from APP to tau protein. And I was precisely wrong in my expectation that this is what was gonna be found. I mean, we found a bunch of kinase inhibitors and they're interesting, but to be honest, we don't know what the organizing logic is to thinking about them. But what Rick Vanderkant and v Vanessa Langness in my group, Rick was a postdoc, Vanessa a graduate student who is soon to finish, uh, if she's here listening, um, uh, took uh, some of the drugs that emerged from the screen and they noticed that a very consistent uh, class of drugs that emerged that dramatically reduced phosphorylation levels of tau were statins and other cholesterol-modulating uh, drugs. And that was an interesting observation because the Alzheimer's literature has a variety of epidemiology studies, some of which suggest that there is an effect of statins, some of which disagree. But there are a number of flaws in the epidemiology studies which were not always well controlled for the use of statins that crossed the blood-brain barrier versus those that did not, or uh, there was also an assumption that if statins were having an effect, it was by virtue of some effect on the periphery uh, collection of lipoproteins, not on uh, brain cells themselves. And what Rick and Vanessa were able to go on and show was that in fact, the statins were acting directly on the neurons, at least in the in vitro cultures. Now, I've shown here, or we've shown here, the cholesterol synthesis pathway, which has a lot of branches and is horrifically complicated uh, in my view. But just to remind you, it basically starts off with HMG-CoA, which by virtue of an enzyme called HMG-CoA reductase, reductase leads to mevalonic acid and its variants. And of course, the thing that one would worry about is that if statins were hacting, having an effect on phosphorylation of tau, it could just be an off-target effect of the drug and have nothing to do with the cholesterol synthesis pathway. And the classical way of testing that idea is to feed the cells mevalonic acid or other downstream uh, intermediates in the cholesterol synthesis pathway and ask whether they rescue a statin-induced phenotype. And as you can see over on the right here, you can probably see it quite a bit better than I can, uh, mevalonate forms rescue the statin-induced reduction in phosphorylated tau, so mevalonic acid and related molecules lead to elevation of phosphorylation of tau saying that the statins are having an effect on the actual cholesterol synthesis pathway itself. 
Now, the other issue with statins is that this cholesterol synthesis pathway has a number of branches leading to geranylated modified proteins and farnesylated modified proteins. And what Rick and Vanessa were able to do was to test drugs that inhibit these branches of the pathway and show that they don't lead to changes of phosphorylation of tau, leading to the conclusion that something down here at the bottom, either cholesterol or its storage form or a breakdown product of cholesterol, were what was modulating tau phosphorylation. And to make a long story short, if you inhibit, for example, uh, and I can't quite see it from here, but an enzyme called squalene synthase, which is relatively late in this cholesterol formation pathway, or if you messed with drugs that inhibited other branches of the pathway between cholesterol and its storage forms, as well as uh, shown in this collection of graphs here that I won't uh, uh, tell you much about given the time, the fact is they were able to show that it's actually a storage form of cholesterol called cholesterol ester, which is the molecule controlling the formation or inducing the formation of phosphorylated tau. And the key experiment in a way that shows that is if you use drugs that interfere with the conversion of cholesterol to cholesterol ester, they lead to the reduction in phosphorylation of tau because they accumulate cholesterol and reduce the amount of cholesterol ester. And that's shown in this graph here. Um, and so it's, and as well as direct measurement of cholesterol forms by lipidomics, it's clear that it is cholesterol ester that is the inducer of tau phosphorylation. Now, you might think that this is just some weird phenomenon of these neurons that have a duplication of the APP gene. But if you take non-demented controls, in this case, Craig Venter, and measure the, response, the dose response to statins, it's just the same as the dose response of APP duplication bearing lines. And in fact, looking at a bunch of different sporadic, sporadic lines here, non-dementic controls here, statins lead to reduction in tau phosphorylation in control lines and in sporadic lines. So whatever is going on is general to a variety of different genetic backgrounds and mutations. Now, to ask the question of whether tau phosphorylation in these neurons was being induced by A beta, which is the inducer in the single hit models of disease pathways, what Rick and Vanessa did was to take advantage of knockouts of the APP gene that we had made in both APP duplication cells as well as in control cells and Craig Venter cells. And what was quite clear is that while these null mutations formed very little A beta, as shown here, whoops, relative to control, in fact, the APP null mutations, non-demented controls, and the APP duplications all had similar dose response for statin-induced formation or induction of tau phosphorylation. And so clearly, whatever is going on, it is not dependent on APP or A beta for the statin effects on tau phosphorylation. Now, the other interesting feature of this system is it was reported a few years ago uh, in Barrett et al. in Science using NMR spectroscopy that the transmembrane region and the region just adjacent to the transmembrane region form a cholesterol binding pocket in the APP protein. And so Vanessa made point mutations that interfered with cholesterol or cholesterol ester binding to APP and looked at whether they could form a beta, for example, and not surprisingly, interfering with cholesterol binding in this transmembrane region reduces a beta formation. And the question is whether cholesterol binding into this pocket is needed for a beta formation and or 
uh, statin res uh, induction of tau phosphorylation. And in a very nice series of experiments, Vanessa and Rick were able to show that while A beta formation was reduced in these cholesterol binding mutations, they would still respond to statins. Sorry, they failed to respond to statins if you interfered with cholesterol binding. Vanessa now thinks because cholesterol is interfering with dimerization of APP in the membrane, but the absence of cholesterol binding doesn't change the characteristics of the statin-induced reduction in tau phosphorylation. So these cholesterol binding mutants of APP can still respond to statin by reducing tau phosphorylation, similar to what we had been thinking from the null mutations. And so what this led us to think is that in general, the pathway leading to phosphorylation of tau is genetically completely separable from the pathways leading to proteolytic cleavage of APP to form a variety of presumed toxic proteolytic breakdown products. Now the other question is mechanistically what's going on, and one clue came from the observation that statins, as well as a drug called efavirenz, which is a drug that leads to stimulation at some doses of the conversion of cholesterol to 24-hydroxycholesterol, which is then exported from cells and removed from the system, you could see that multiple tau phosphorylation sites are reduced. So it's not just threonine-231 that's affected by these drugs. And in fact, Rick and Vanessa were able to go on to show using either inhibitors of the lysosome or inhibitors of the proteasome that inhibition of the proteasome led to resistance of these cells to the induction of statin-induced tau phosphorylation reductions. And so the thought is that what, what's happening is that it's activation of the proteasome that's leading to degradation of uh, phosphorylated forms of tau protein, and that that's what's leading then to the reduction of phosphotau by statins. Now, one other thing they were able to show, one question that constantly comes up in experiments like this is, well, maybe you're getting rid of phosphotau because the neurons are dying. And in fact, Vanessa was able to test directly whether statins or efavirenz were leading to neuronal death. And those curves are shown in red, which are neuron viability following statin or efavirenz treatment. Neuronal viability seemed to be unaffected by these drugs. Somewhat perturbingly, when she checked astrocytes, astrocytes are killed rather efficiently, at least in vitro, by statins, leading to one, yes, I see Sally frowning here, <laughs> leading to one being a little worried about whether statins might induce cognitive defects under some circumstances. And once again, the literature is a little bit confused on this point, whether statins will induce cognitive decline or not. Um, and in fact, as I'll mention in a moment, although the mechanism is not entirely clear, doses of efavirenz that are beneficial for tau reduction don't lead to changes in astrocytic or neuronal viability, but there's quite a bit of reason to believe that at elevated doses, such as those used for treatment of AIDS patients, what I didn't tell you is that efavirenz was originally developed as a reverse transcriptase inhibitor, um, if you elevate the dose above uh, the minimum necessary, you do in fact see cognitive decline in efavirenz treated mice at least, and there's concern in human patients as well. Um, but uh, interestingly, in this uh, system that we've been studying in neurons, efavirenz has an effect directly on cytochrome 46A1, which for those of you in the know, is an enzyme that converts cholesterol to 24-hydroxycholesterol. 
So at low doses, at least, efavirenz stimulates that enzyme, leading to a reduction of cholesterol itself and a reduction, of course, of cholesterol ester, the storage form for excess cholesterol. And the thought based on these experiments now is that cholesterol ester has one pathway running through APP binding to the formation of the A-beta proteolytic fragment, but through this proteosomal pathway leading to reductions in the level of phosphorylated tau. And in the context of disease, the notion is that both of these products together may be leading to synapse loss, and that efavirenz might be useful for promoting the degradation of phosphorylated tau, and one hopes for the reduction in neurofibrillary tangles. Now, this is the point at which I uh, point out the dirty little secret of studies of iPS-derived neurons in culture, and that is these neurons are almost certainly, and the evidence suggests this uh, as well, that these neurons are fetal in form and in their biochemistry. And so detractors of these in vitro human neuron systems will argue that yeah, you can't really learn anything about a late onset disease using fetal neurons in culture and why are you wasting our time and money. Uh, but uh, we recently went on to work with Robert Rissman to test statins and efavirenz and a natural product called berberine, which also uh, acts in this system. And in fact, mice that ordinarily form large levels of cortical neurofibrillary tangles, when you treat with these drugs at a modest concentration, in fact, have pronounced reduction in neurofibrillary tangle burden in these adult mice. So at the very least, these fetal human neurons tell us how to treat mouse brain pathology. And of course, what's needed is an actual clinical trial. There's a clinical trial that's in the planning and early execution stages of efferens for human Alzheimer's disease in human patients. Uh, Rick and I have had a number of discussions about this, and it's pretty clear that the planned trial uses doses of efavirenz that are probably in the inhibitory range as opposed to the stimulatory range for cytochrome 46A1, the 24-hydroxycholesterolase. Uh, and in fact, we're discussing with a foundation now launching a trial of efavirenz both at much lower doses as well as monitoring tau pathology by tau pet and by CSF uh, tau uh, measurements. And so we'd add to the risk factors here the levels of cholesterol and of course its storage form cholesterol ester. You can, I, I presume, sit down and draw any number of different arrows and pathways based on what we and others have found thus far, but it's clear that this may be a useful target. I still uh, suggest that this may be upstream of transcytotic and endocytic trafficking since cholesterol levels are going to be fairly different in different regions of these cells and in different organelle forms, and so in these highly polarized cells, where you put the cholesterol may be just as important as how much of it there is, but this is something that has to be tested in a great deal more uh, depth. So I'll conclude by thanking, again, CIRM that funded the early stages of our IPS work, where, and in addition, the early stages of drug discovery. Some of this has been supported by the NIH. Much of this work was done by Vanessa and Rick, who have worked together on this project and a host of other collaborators over the years in San Diego and elsewhere. So thank you very much for your time. I won't stand in your way any longer.